welcome for this time together. I want to first begin praying. And Lord, I thank you for your presence. I invite you to come. I invite you to come, Holy Ghost, to come and touch our hearts this afternoon. Touch us with fresh, with your presence, with fresh fire, with your glory. And come and move this afternoon. And come and speak to us. Because these are such crucial times. Year 2012. By the way, today is February 29th, special day. And I really am privileged to be up here. And, and to begin, I want to blow the shofar. Because I know the shofar is going to release something fresh into your life, into my life, into this place, into our nation. And that's what we need today. Say, Holy Ghost, come. We need you. We love you. And we love you, Jesus. We love you, Father. Thank you for being so gracious to us. And thank you for the new things you're doing right now. In the name of Jesus. We are up here on the mountain called the Renden. It's a beautiful spring day, like you can see. And if we look further, we can see in the in the uh, on the horizon we can see the Swiss Alps. It's very beautiful. Just behind the cloud, you can see. I hope you can. I can from here. And I want to today discover with you a little bit the history of this place. It's a wonderful place. It's very quiet. It's a wonderful place to come and pray. And I want to just share with you what happened here several hundred years ago. Well, this is a special day. And I want to start reading the scripture. And I want to ask you to stand with me. You know, the scripture is God's word. The word of the Almighty God He has given to us, children. And I believe it's something special, something very precious, as we read the word. And I want to read it out of Matthew 16, that very special scripture. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist some Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets he said to them but who do you say that I am Simon Peter answered and said you are the Messiah the son of the living God Jesus answered and said to him blessed are you Simon Barjona for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my father who is in heaven and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosened in heaven. What an amazing world. You know, Jesus has been roaming around with his disciples and performing lots of miracles and signs and wonders, preaching the word, preaching, bringing God's kingdom back into the life of the people. And suddenly he's saying, hey, Peter, who do you think I am? And all these crazy answers had been spoken before. And finally, Peter said, I am, you are the Messiah, 
You are the Messiah, the anointed one, the one we are waiting for, for hundreds of years. And then, because of that uh, amazing revelation Peter had got from the Father through the Holy Ghost, Jesus said, you are Peter, and on this rock, by the way, I'm also standing here on a rock, but it's not the same rock. What is the rock? The rock is Jesus. The rock is not Peter. The rock is Jesus. If you still think the rock is Peter, then you have a problem. Get it out of your mind and get the right stuff in. The rock is Jesus. And what is the key? The key is that Jesus is the Messiah. The one uh, the Lord, the Father had been releasing prophecy through his prophets that there's a Messiah coming who is going to redeem the people and save the people. And finally, Jesus was this Messiah. That's the key. And I believe on that key, on that revelation that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus was and is building his church today. That means, even today, the core, the, the very core belief is that Jesus has been sent from heaven. He was conceived in Maria's womb through the power of the Holy Ghost, totally supernatural. He was born, he was raised, he was finally crucified for our sins. He rose on the third day because the Father of Heaven reached down and reached him, took him back from the dead, gave brought him back to life, and finally he went to heaven, and he's waiting in heaven to return until finally we have get the job done to preach the gospel to all the nations, and he can come back in glory. It's a great story. It's the core story of the gospels, and it's so important that we continually profess and preach that. That Jesus is the Messiah. That Jesus is the only one who went to the cross because he loved us so much. That he gave his life for us. And he gave his blood for us. And that because of that blood he can be washed from sin, from bondage, from chain. It is the only thing which can wash you from sin. It's the only thing which washes you in order that one day you can be brought up to heaven by the angels and have an entry key to heaven. The entry key is the name of Jesus, is the blood of Jesus, is the fact that you have given your life to him, that you are born again, and that your name is written in the book of life of heaven. Well, this is the foundation of the gospel. And now something to this stone. You know, this is a memorial stone. It's a very important place, I believe. A place where lots of history has taken place. Uh, and you know, this was when 500 years ago, the power and the fire of the Holy Ghost swept over Europe. And a mighty reformation took place. A revival took place. And God used a several men. One of them was like Martin Luther. Another one was Calvin. Another one was uh, 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 and, uh, several others who God used like Moses to bring back the people of God back out of the darkness of those ages where the church has been preaching great heresies, great deception. In fact, it was at the point where most of the people in church were not saved anymore and could not be saved because the preaching got so wrong. And finally Martin Luther came back and began preaching that very foundational truth of the gospel to the people. That they can be saved by grace, through faith, in Jesus Christ. A great truth. And so they finally came out of Egypt. Martin Luther brought thousands and thousands and thousands uh, out of Egypt for the glory of God. The very interesting point was 
that at the same time as this happened, a second birth took place in the church. You know, I believe very similar than when, when, uh, when Isaac had a son. You know, if, uh, of course, his wife Rebecca gave birth to his son, and suddenly they realized, hey, it's not just one son, it's two sons. It was Esau and it was Jacob. And in the same time, when, when the Holy Ghost swept over Europe, a birthing took place and there were two sons born. Out of this time of great darkness, a son was called and who became later on the reformed movement, a movement in those days which was alive. But a second movement took place and it was the, what we called the Anabaptist. You know, the amazing thing was Martin Luther and his friends, the reformer, the revelations they had from the Lord was to restore the first and second foundation of, of faith. The first repentance, not by works, but through grace. Repentance through the working of the Holy Spirit. And, and through faith, you shall be saved. You through faith in Jesus Christ alone, not through works, not through any kind of stupid pain, letters, and whatever. No, just by faith through grace. So God was able through Martin Luther to restore the first uh, foundations of faith. But you know, these are the first two of seven. And God wanted to push further. The Holy Ghost wanted to push further. And there was a group of people, like those underground churches from before. They already knew about the third foundation of faith. What is the third foundation of faith? It means to be baptized in water. Very simple thing. Exactly like you can read through the book of Acts. Uh, uh, that when once you are born again, once you are saved, you have to be baptized in water. Not at the child's birth. This is bogus, and I will preach about a little bit about that. Why? But this group re suddenly received the revelation. Well, if we are born again, if we found faith in Jesus, then we need to be baptized. So they got baptized, and because of that, they started to be greatly persecuted. And amazing. Thousands of them were killed. Why? Because uh, it was it brought big trouble to the land but the amazing thing was we are here at a place we are here which was uh, beginning of approximately 1527 was a gathering place for all those who received who were uh, baptized in water who became Anabaptists in fact, from the valley from below here, and then from this place over there, over there in a few miles from uh, in this direction, is the little town called Schleitheim. It is a little town where also the declaration of Schleitheim was done. That the declaration of Schleitheim is the first and foundational declaration of faith done by the Anabaptist leaders when they gathered in that little town, a few miles from here down, and most probably in a hurry, in an evening night, some were already running from persecution, they gathered together in a little barn, we don't know exactly which house it was, and that's where they put together their thoughts, what is today the revelation, the keys for God's people of today. Of course it was that Jesus Christ is born and, and died for our sins, but then they put together a few other points which are essential from the Word of God, and, and then uh, from that point this declaration of faith became the foundational declaration of faith for the Anabaptist people. And the interesting point was, through, for more than 100 years, the town of Schleitheim was like a safe haven for the Anabaptists. But always when it became rough, they had to go hiding in the woods. And right behind or in this direction down, uh, in these woods down here, these were the woods where they were hiding from Schleitheim. But also up here, in this direction is, is the city of Schaffhausen, 
So somehow in this area, this was the hiding place when from the different places they were gathering to come and have fellowship together and worship the Lord in freedom. Because the only place outside was possible uh, uh, out in the woods to worship the Lord in freedom. And the interesting point, why is this stone? This stone here is to remind us this story. What happened was, and we knew that, you know, I'm from this valley down here, and 20 years ago, 15 years ago, when the intercessors started to arise and pray for revival, the Lord said there are three things which need to be done in order that revival can come. The first thing was to cleanse the land from bloodshed, through prayer, through repentance, through the shedding of the blood of Jesus over the land. The second point was, we need to repent for the sins, how we have been persecuting and killing the Anabaptists for no reason. And because this happened, this happened a lot in Switzerland from this time period, 1527, when the revival broke out, when the Reformation broke out, until approximately 1680, when literally all the Baptists were chased away from the major areas where they lived, uh, which was a great sin in our land, which was literally when the nation gave room for the spirit of death to kill everything which was, had life. It was a great sin. But then in the 90s, people started to repent for this great crime we Switzerland has committed as a nation, it's, uh, but foremost the body of Christ, because it was a sin which happened through the body of Christ. Was two bo brothers were born and one persecutes the other. I mean, it is ridiculous, you know. And But what happened was, finally in 2003 and afterwards in 2004, two great conferences happened in Switzerland. And in these conferences, the Anabaptists from all over the world were invited to come back and we repented for our sins. And this is a very long story, but I know these were two absolutely great conferences. The first one was organized by Schleife through the leadership of Gary and Lilo Keller. And then the second one was literally hosted by the official state church who repented of their sins and of their crimes. And this is, and, and then in order to remember the, not just the sin, but also the fact that we repented, this stone here was placed as a memorial stone of that history, as a memorial stone that in this land God has been raising up faithful people who walk with him. And I'm going to show in a minute about this stone, what it means. But first I'm going to go a bit more into the history. You know, by the way, I had a chance uh, right after the stone here was placed here to come up here with a group of American visitors, Anabaptists, descendants of the Anabaptists, who went on the second conference in Zurich for this reconciliation. And we had a wonderful time coming up here, coming here, and, and then finally here having a service together, worshiping the Lord in freedom. And, you know, I, I want to I wanna share here two to three different things. I remember one particular conversation with one of the members and I was asking about these different points. One of the points the Anabaptists affirmed was we will not be part of the earthly army who fights and does bloodshed because we have been redeemed by the blood. And so, of course, I respect that point greatly. But as we were talking uh, about the army, that man said, that brother in the Lord said, you know, we are not going to army because we are the army. Very powerful statement. And I tell you this is true today. And in fact, one of the reasons when the Lord started to call me to come up here and pray and blow the shofar was, is the reason because today God is again raising up an army. What does that mean? An army are people who are disciplined and focused and trained for a mission. These are not people, these are not ordinary people. These are people who are trained. These are people who are under order. People who are disciplined. And that's in fact what the body of Christ today is. God is raising up a bride. God is raising up an army who loves him, but also who is disciplined to follow him, 
follow, to hear his voice, to follow him and to do his works, exactly like an earthly army operates and, and executes the orders they receive in the very same way we, the body of Christ, who are filled, who are born again, who are filled and baptized with the Holy Ghost, walk with him and obey him and execute the things he shows us to do in the very same way. And what the Lord told me was, he's again raising an army who exactly like those people of old who were faithful, who had received the word of God, who were born again, who with all the understandings they received from the word of God were radical to apply it and to follow Jesus in the very same way he's raising up an army today and of course there is one difference one difference is of course in the meantime since 1527 God has been revealing much more has given us much more understanding of the word of God we are not standing on the first one and two and three foundations of faith praise God God has been over the past decades revealing so much more he has been revealing the baptism of the Holy Ghost which is the fourth foundation of faith he has been revealing about the laying on of hands that means we are an army who can go out and lay on hands on people and they shall be healed they shall be recovered demons shall come out people shall be delivered of demons yes foundational very easy simple it's very easy when the Holy Ghost is here when the presence of God is here but this is the fifth foundation of faith there is a sixth foundation of faith sixth foundation of faith is to walk in God's resurrection power God wants you and me to walk in God's resurrection power and there is the seventh foundation of faith this is the the teaching of the justice of God God is a God of justice I tell you God has eternal justice he has revealed his justice through his word and we're gonna meet him once in the air and there we will we will come before the throne of justice and he will judge us after our deeds after our words after everything we have done and of course those who are in trouble who are not redeemed who are not born again are in big trouble because they have to go to hell for eternity and we who are saved we will have that great privilege to be in heaven with him but our words and deeds are going to be judged that means they're going to be uh, evaluated and for the good things we have done the things which have been done through the leading of the holy ghost we're going to receive a reward isn't it amazing but the same, the similarity is God wants to raise us who have received today so much more to walk in the same radical way like our ancestors of old who were not afraid to lay their life down and to be killed for the truth of the gospel. And that's going to become very important today because God is raising up an army who is exactly the same or even more radical this is so important today and God wants us again to build on that very same foundation which has been led by our ancestors who have given their blood for us you know and I want to share one or two points when we were up here with this group of Americans at a certain point came also the question what do you think why was there such a terrific such a terrible, and a terrific, a terrible persecution, and so many had to give their blood. So many has to be have been stripped of property, you know. Or they had when they were some of when they were discovered to be Baptist and a Baptist, they have been stripped of all their property and chased away. You know, it shows how evil the Swiss people were in those times, you know. And some are still today, by the way. Harpendai. I believe there have been several points. One point was this. In those days, you know, the Anabaptists refused to have their children baptized because it's not scriptural. It's true. Uh, child baptism is a great heresy. It's not true. You can only baptize somebody when he's born again by the Spirit. By Spirit and Word. Then you can baptize somebody. And in order to do that, you have to be 
at least six, seven years old. You know, it's, you can baptize a child. You can baptize a teeny. Uh, you can be 70 to be baptized, no problem. But it is a done, it's an act to be done to confirm that you are born again. But why was there so much bloodshed on that point? Well, I believe there were two reasons. One reason was, in those days, there was only one person in the town who kept civil records. And this was the pastor. And if you would not allow your children to be baptized, which means you refuse that they're recorded in the civil court. Uh, and, and this is a bad thing, you know. Because there needs to be some basic civil records. This is normal. But I believe this was not the real reason. There was another reason which was much more prevalent, which we started to discover when we started to pray over our valley in the past 20 years. You know? And in order to explain you that point, I have to go a little bit more back in history. You know, when the gospel came to this area in the 6th, 7th, 8th, Eighth century. In those days, they were, we were all pagans. We were like the wild Vikings. We were just evil. We were worshiping demons. We did child sacrifice. We did. Uh, in those days, there was a, a demonic worship going on. There was adultery, fornication, uh, idol fornication anything going on in this area it, like all over Europe that's why that's how it was in those days in those days of ignorance and when the, and those that means those people they had places where they came together to worship their demons and to do sacrifice and one day the gospel came and those people gave their life to Jesus and of course some were forced often it was that the whole community gave their life to Jesus and started to worship Jesus. And when this happened, what happened? They simply said, okay, now instead of worshiping demons, we worship Jesus. So that place we gather, let's transform it and make it a place where we worship Jesus. And so, on that very place where before idol worship happened, suddenly they worship Jesus. Now, this is a very great thing. This is a wonderful thing. And I believe I'm very thankful for what happened throughout Europe. When the gospel came and sweeped through Europe, that all day these people started to forsake uh, the idol worship and fornication and all the evil practices. But the problem was, they built in the places where they have done idol worship, they built a church and they turned a stone of sacrifice and made the stone of sacrifice where before for centuries some of the most evil sacrifices took place between sexual worship and and, uh, and the demon worship and, and uh, sacrifices of children and of animals they simply transformed that stone and made it to be the stone of baptism and that means because the whole child baptism which started to be performed was anyway not scriptural at all. As soon as this kind of worship began and this kind of church began, immediately it became dry and cold. Even so in the beginning people uh, had miracles and believed in God. That they saw that the God of the Christians is stronger than the idol worship. But with the newfound faith, immediately there was a big gap of idolatry coming in and of uh, demon worship and all kinds. And in fact, when a child was baptized from that stone, what happened in the spirit was that the curse from that stone was placed on that child. And of course, that's why even so the gospel had been preached in Europe in those centuries, 12, 13, 14 century, there was still was wild years. There was still so much evil going on, killing, plundering, going over and raiding. Even so these people tried to be Christian. Why? Because the demonic presence was still prevalent and the demonic curses 
were already at birth passed on the children. And the amazing thing was, when the Reformation came, there were a group of people who began to have light to say, hey, let's stop that nonsense. Most probably they had no clue why they stopped it, but they listened to the Holy Ghost who said, don't do that anymore. And when they stopped, the devils got angry, very, very angry, and started to raise up everything. They raised up hell to persecute these people who refused that the curses of old were passed down to the young generation, which was passed on through baptism. You know, I tell you, it's, it's crazy how church history is twisted and how we did so many crooked things in the name of God. And you know, wars was one thing, but when you start to do that with the little child in childhood and already they have placed curses on children, what can you expect later on? I personally believe this is the reason why the Anabaptists were so highly persecuted in those centuries, 15, 16, 17th centuries, and had to flee, had to be chased out. And you know, today I preach that because there is repentance. There is a place of repentance. And I want to tell you, if you know that there is a curse in your life, I tell you, you can be set free. If you know that you have been part, if you are ancestors, if you had Swiss ancestries of those who persecuted, today you can be forgiven. And I'm preaching here because I want to also preach forgiveness. I want to tell you that I forgive from my heart for all those who have committed these crimes, persecution. But I want to also say, today is a place where you can be set free of curses. I want to pray a prayer right now. Because God is a God of deliverance. God is the Almighty God. And His Son Jesus sets us free from all the curses, from all sicknesses. And he, there is a place right now where you can come. But there is also a place where you can come and say, hey, I want to be part of that army. I want to, I'm tired and sick and tired of this lukewarm Christianity who is not preaching the word of God, who is not uh, living the word of God, who is not walking in the whole counsel of that book. You know, this is a great book, 66 books given to us. And they all contain such amazing truth from cover to cover. And it is about that we, today we need this, this truth from cover to cover to, in order to walk with Jesus in an in a pro, appropriate way. And I want to tell you there's a lot of grace today. Today is a day of grace. And whatever you, you need, you can come and God will touch us right now. And that's what I want to pray. That right now God is going to touch you and set you free from the curses of the past, from the curses of religion, from the curses of sickness, from the curses of adultery, from the curses of fornication, and from the curses of idolatry. I break them right now in Jesus' name. And I speak out a blessing in your life. And I pray right now that you can be right now filled with the Holy Ghost. That you can be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Baptized means that you can say, Holy Ghost, come into my life and fill me with the presence, with the fire, and with the glory and with the power of God so I can be different because with the presence of the Holy Ghost in your life with Him in your life with Him the Holy Ghost in your life your life is going to change with Him the curse is going to be broken with Him the blessing of Jesus is going to come in your life right now and I pray right now Holy Ghost come and everybody who is hungry and thirsty after you come and baptize Him Come and touch him right now. Baptize him in the Holy Ghost. And release the blessing, the blessings of Jesus, the blessings of the Father right now into their life. And return and overturn the curse in the name of Jesus.